Hello. 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 Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I suppose it's afternoon or evening. I don't know because I've been all the day long here, and I don't know where the sun is right now. Anyway, uh, welcome to this session. We are going to talk about uh, how to integrate da data as an urban service. It has been said uh, many times that the internet has changed almost everything, but it has not changed cities yet. So uh, the internet as a paradigm of the digital revolution, uh, call it smart cities, technology applied to cities. How is this going to change cities? Cities were born in the first big revolution, the, the agriculture. Before the agriculture, there were no cities. After the agriculture, for many millennia, there were cities. But they changed and they, they uh, became the cities we know today with the Industrial Revolution, the second big revolution. Now we have the third big revolution of human history, technological revolution, I mean, which is uh, the digital revolution with the internet, with mobility, with waves and waves and waves of, of innovation and technology. How is this going to change our cities? Should they change? Should they become smart? Of course, they are cities, but uh, what is this talk about the smart? We have uh, six distinguished guests, colleagues here to talk about this. We have uh, Dan Hill, who is uh, executive uh, director, uh, future and best practices for uh, Future Cities Catapult. Then we have uh, Jordi Albiñá, who, who is uh, advisor to the, the Director General uh, of Abertis Telecom. Then we have uh, Carlo Ratti, uh, Director uh, of uh, MIT Sensible City Lab and founding partner of Carlo Ratti Associ Associati. So he's with uh, MIT and Carlo Ratti Associati. Then we have uh, Peter Quek Ser We, who is the Chief Information Officer uh, of the Urban De Redevelopment Authority in Singapore. Then we have uh, Amr Salem, uh, Global Managing Director of Smart Cities and Internet of Everything of Cisco. And finally, last but not least, uh, Jose Antonio Rubio, Analytics Manager from Indra Systems. So, uh, the word is yours, gentlemen. Uh, in three minutes, give us our, your view of how we integrate data as an urban services or whatever you like. Uh, Dan? Um, thank you. You just added the whatever you like bit at the last minute there, so I better not do that. Um, so three minutes isn't long to talk about this uh, big question. So I guess I'll try to boil it down. I'm not so interested in data so much or infrastructure necessarily. Um, they're important, but they're not the reason why we make cities. Um, I, I prefer to look at the other end, if you like, the services side, where things touch citizens directly, because I think that's where we can then have a conversation with citizens about the value of these things, the value of these technologies. It's very difficult to, to talk about the value with citizens and indeed politicians, and we have to do both to get things done in cities um, when we're talking purely infrastructure. So focusing on services instead and focusing on the way that things actually hit the streets, the execution and delivery details, I think, is fundamental. And in fact, that's where we can see that the Internet is changing cities, I think. Um, things like Airbnb and Uber are radically changing the way that cities work. You could describe them as Internet of Things services in a way. They're, f they're physical outcomes moving with digital dynamics within them. So that's directly Internet of Things and Internet changing cities, I think. Similarly, other public transport startups like Bridge or Urban Engines are beginning to use predictive analytics, sensors, actuators, big data, mobile systems and things, but they pull it down to a consumer-focused service of some kind, where again, we can have a conversation about value, or do we want that kind of thing in our city? Do we want a tr public transport system which is a universal service and equally accessible for all, or just delivers for a privileged few? Those things only come out when you actually make the thing, when you have to execute it. So what that looks like is then service design, user experience design, interaction design, 
um, working directly again to produce services. We have um, an example of this from earlier this year, a project we did with Microsoft UK and Guide Dogs for the Blind called Cities Unlocked, which made a, a headset that blind people could work, visually impaired people. A bit like this headset, but rather more comfortable, actually, um, which has sensors in it, and the sensors talk to the mobile phone, and the phone talks to beacons in the environment, and it creates a 3D soundscape that enables people to visually move, to visually impaired people to move around the city with much greater confidence than they would otherwise do. So there's a dedicated need, there's a set of citizens we can work with to solve a problem. We're using technology, of course, but what we were talking about there is the service. And only when we derive the service do we then find the use case for embedding Bluetooth LE beacons in bus stops, for instance. So I'd say start with the services, start with the street, start with something we can test the value with citizens, something that flushes out the privacy issues, the ethical issues around things. Um, is it desirable to people? Is there a business model behind it? Who owns it? Those are really core issues, and you get that from working from the services back towards the data. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, for your vision on services. Um, Jordi, you may tell us something about uh, infrastructures. Muchas gracias, Manel. Buenas tardes. Uh, ante todo, Avertis Telecom es una compañía de infraestructuras, de infraestructuras de telecomunicación. Por tanto, nuestro foco es, está en este ámbito de las infraestructuras. Nosotros llevamos unos cuantos años analizando el, el devenir de lo que se ha venido a llamar las Smart Cities, las ciudades inteligentes. Eh, muy principalmente con la, el municipio de Barcelona, pero no solamente con él, con otros municipios. Y hemos observado que hay un elemento fundamental, quizá menos vistoso que el de los servicios, quizá menos vistoso que el de la puesta a disposición de las administraciones, de las compañías, de los ciudadanos, de los datos, que es el de las infraestructuras. Si un, una ciudad, si no construye adecuadamente una red mallada y diversa de infraestructuras de telecomunicación, difícilmente podrá captar la, la multiplicidad de datos de orígenes muy diversos, no solamente de los sensores, que en principio lo que todo el mundo hablaba en el concepto de Smart Cities, estaban los sensores. Después hemos visto que ahí están también los servicios prestados por la propia Administración Pública Municipal, los servicios prestados por las, las compañías concesionarias de servicios municipales, los servicios prestados por no importa qué empresa privada que actúa en la ciudad, las redes sociales, el Internet, hay multiplicidad de fuentes que generan datos. Estos datos hay que recogerlos, hay que integrarlos, hay que compararlos, hay que consolidarlos, hay que ponerlos eh, a disposición de los sistemas que después eh, se decidan de una forma sólida. Para ello es necesario que la ciudad disponga de, una, de un conjunto de redes integradas, gestionadas de manera homogénea, que permitan recoger todos estos millones de datos que van a aparecer y los lleve a un repositorio donde se trabajen, donde se analicen, donde se consoliden y donde se pongan a disposición de las personas interesadas, las empresas interesadas. Hemos también observado que una de las grandes barreras de entrada para el desarrollo de las ciudades inteligentes en, la, en cuanto a la recogida de datos y en general para el desarrollo del Internet de las cosas, del Internet of Things, es el coste de las comunicaciones asociadas a los sensores. Por tanto, hemos estado buscando una alternativa eficiente tecnológicamente, eficiente económicamente, para romper esa barrera de entrada. Hemos, y en España ya hemos implantado en todo el, en todo el Estado una red para Internet de las Cosas que conviviendo con las redes de telecomunicaciones clásicas, de fibra óptica, de Wi-Fi, de telefonía móvil, no importa cualquier otra, uh, permite, asociado, como digo, a estas otras clásicas, dar el salto necesario para que millones de dispositivos a un coste muy, 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 muy bajo puedan incorporarse a, al desarrollo de la ciudad inteligente. Bueno, esta es nuestra visión y es lo que nosotros estamos aportando al desarrollo de las Smart Cities en España y en otros países. Gracias. Ok, thanks very much. Uh, Carlo, you are a, an architect, an engineer, but uh, an innovator. Um, how do you see the, the, these technologies uh, changing the way we, we live in cities, we, we understand cities? Thank you. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Um, I speak in English. So what I wanted to share with you is um, <clears throat> when we think about infrastructure in the city today, usually the problems with infrastructure are not problem of capacity overall, 
but they're usually a problem of peaks. If you think actually just the street next door going to Barcelona, the problem is a few minutes per day when actually there's a lot of cars and then you get a big traffic jam, but otherwise, you know, that, that road has a lot of sp spare capacity and free capacity. Um, and um, uh, so what can then big data do? Well, big data can do a lot in order to actually help us use better our infrastructure. And let me give you two examples. One example is exactly what Dan was mentioning before. He was talking about Airbnb. Well, Airbnb is quite interesting for me because it is something where, look, you know, in, in a city like Paris, you've got, I believe, 16,000 new units on the market. And, you know, that's like, if you multiply that for all of the world, it's like building hundreds or maybe thousands of new hotels. But you don't, put, you don't move one brick, you just release a spare capacity on the system. <coughs> so you utilize much better what you had there. And I think you know, that's a beautiful thing about when we have big data in real time about our city. You know, Airbnb would not have happened just uh, 10 years ago because you didn't have this real time information we now have in our pockets with an app, on a website, and so on. You know, and there's many, many examples along the same lines. I want to mention just you know, one example about um, a project we just did at MIT. Uh, it was published <coughs> just a few weeks ago. And what we did, we took all the taxi data for New York. And then we asked ourselves, what would be the minimum number of vehicles in order to take everybody to destination when they need to be there if people were ready to share more? You know, as we see with Airbnb and many other things, people are more happy to share things today. So what would be the minimum infrastructure? Well, what you find is quite amazing, and I want to leave you with this uh, as, a, as an ending, is two things. If you actually just assume a system where people are ready to share more the car, what is, you know, in English, we say ride sharing, share the ride more, then you could take everybody to the destination exactly when they need to be there, in New York and in most cities around the planet, it doesn't matter on density, with 40% less car. So you can take away four cars out of 10 and you still take everybody to destination when they need to be there. If people then were to, ready to share more also the car, especially with self-driving coming, the beautiful thing about self-driving is that we actually, the car can give you a lift in the morning to a place and then can give a lift to somebody else in your family or in the city. So in a certain sense, you can share the car much better. Well, if you combine the two things, then you get a city where you could get rid, finally get rid of 80% of the cars we have on our, in our cities. You know that 80% of useless lumps of metal that are idle most of the day, you could get rid of them and still take everybody to the destination when they need to be there. And I think that's a good example of how tomorrow's infrastructure actually can work much better thanks to big data. The same thing applies you know, to hotels, to the road infrastructure, to the grid, to the electrical grid, to most of the infrastructure we have. And I think so that we should focus going forward uh, a bit more on the digital side than on the physical one. If you want, thinking about a solution which is less asphalt and more silicon. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Peter, you're the CIO of a, c a big city, and in fact, a big city state. Uh, what is your vision of? Uh, of the, the strategic deployment of uh, geospatial data, analytics, and the like. Yeah, uh, I, I, I work for the Urban Redevelopment Authority, or URI of Singapore. And uh, URI is a land use planning authority of Singapore with a mission to make Singapore a great city to live, to work, and to play. Uh, Singapore is a small island city state in Southeast Asia. Um, we are about 710 square kilometer, housing 5.4 million people. So it's very dense. We are one of the highest uh, density in the population in the world. Um, we, we are quite fortunate, we do it quite well economically. I think we are uh, really one of the most um, economically uh, competitive country in the world and also um, high quality living in Asia. But city planning is really a, a work in progress. We never achieve and we never arrive. And we face problems all the time. Many of the problems are also faced by other cities. But there are two problems that are very unique to Singapore. First is a small land size. Uh, we are a city, but we're also a country, so we need to cater for city function, housing, transportation, recreation. We also have to cater for country function, seaport, uh, airport, uh, military training ground, reservoir, nature reserve. So there's a lot of constraint on land. So when we develop further uh, for economic developments, we need to be able to make use of data, technology, engineering, innovation to optimize land, going underground, going above ground. Uh, second challenge is really about aging population. We have a fertility rate of about 1.29, one of the lowest in the world. So we are aging rapidly. So in planning, we need to be able to cater for uh, changing in demographic. 
social services, infrastructure services to cater for these demographic changes. And at the same time, um, to replace the uh, labor force, we need to bring in capitals, bring in talents. So for planning, we, we look at it, it's really these challenges also uh, place good opportunity for us. So um, uh, making use of data innovation, technology innovation, and social innovation. So in planning, we look at multi-time scale planning, long-term, mid-term, and short-term. In long-term, we have this thing called concept plan. We plan Singapore um, 50, looking at 50 years ahead of Singapore. Um, of course, no one can predict the future. But what we can do is really look at uh, use of data and analytic modeling tools to help us understand the city better, have a way to look at different parameter mix, do sin scenario planning. So one of the projects we are doing is an integrated city planning system, mesh out data from different uh, government uh, data agencies and help us to do this. And in the midterm, it's what we call master plan. We do the master plan once in every five years, looking at development of Singapore in the next 15, 20 years. Uh, there's a time frame that we have more firm understanding about the population and economic growth. But what is important for us is to look at the provision of public infrastructure. Um, the metro, the bus network, the water, the energy, and so on. And how to optimize and sequencing the deployment orders so that we time it such that we make um, very wise investment at the right time. Uh, so we are working out a, a de uh, what we call urban uh, system dashboard that will help us to uh, look at the different uh, scenarios. And the short term is looking at something in two to five years, and that's a very time frame that we are quite firm about the development. It could be a sport hub, it could be housing development, it could be a park. And in this aspect, we find it's very important for us to, to engage the citizen, to understand their concern about the development that's going to impact on their daily life, the disruption, the diversion. So, um, um, so these are the things we do. So in summary, we look at from planning for multi ten scale development and making use of different type of data, technology to help us to do that better. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, Amr, you, you are responsible for internet of everything. So that includes everything. So that includes cities. So how is uh, the internet of everything for cities? Manuel, thank you very much and appreciate it. Uh, thanks to you and congratulations on putting together a big event with the organizers. Um, over the past couple of days, I've had the fortune of meeting many of our cities here that are participating. And one consistent challenge that everybody brings up is the siloed nature of how cities operate and the lack of integration between different agencies and departments. Traditionally, cities would invest in infrastructure, in projects that are all the way from the applications to the data center, to the, com to the communication infrastructure, all the way to the sensors, that is dedicated infrastructure for one use case. What we believe is cities should be looking at this from a bottoms-up approach infrastructure first to allow for the use of multiple use cases. Deconstruct the nature of these vertical silos into small common components across the multiple silos, across the multiple different uh, use cases that are being required for the smart city approach. So things like the sensor that is being used for traffic control is the same sensor that could deliver data necessary for the security system. So no need to do it twice, just use the same sensor. The communication infrastructure required for most of these is the same communication infrastructure required. If you deconstruct these systems into common elements, leverage the investment across multiple systems, you'll be able to read from multiple types of sensors and present the data in a common format to multiple types of applications, irrespective of where the data is coming from. This way, you open up also the data for the use of uh, industries, small and medium enterprises, startups, to be able to leverage this data and create new apps and new business models that would fuel the industry in the city. So it's not just for use of the applications, but it's also for developing industry that is capable of fueling the growth of the city economically, socially, and environmentally as well. Well, I'm, I'm the moderator. I'm not supposed to say, to, to tell how uh, I agree with that. So uh, let's go with, uh, <laughs> let's go uh, to Jose Antonio from, uh, from Indra. You are the analytics manager of your company. Yeah. Analytics is one of the key words uh, that we hear uh, on and on. Sure. How do you see the, uh, the, 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 the role of analytics in cities? 
well, uh, analytics is uh, an exciting arena uh, inside the, the smart city problems. Um, our vision at, at Indra as uh, the largest IT global company in, in, in Spain and Latin America is how to solve um, the current and the old problems of the cities uh, using uh, the, the new technologies. Mm, we are uh, uh, focused on, on how to solve uh, uh, problems and, and how to balance the three corners of a very magic triangle that we, that we see. First, in the first corner is the, uh, the innovation, the innovation challenges that uh, all, uh, all players are, are uh, emphasizing in this, in, this, uh, in this era. In other corner is the, the employment. Uh, we have a, a big problem in our, in our uh, uh, society around the, the employment how to, to create uh, uh, with uh, uh, wealth uh, generation, hmm? how to balance, how to plan, how to manage all the efforts in terms of uh, um, uh, become uh, all these corners uh, in, a, in a right decision, uh, sorting the, 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 the mid and, and the long term of investment, and mainly how to, to, to show the, 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 uh, the society the results how to show the, um, the return of my own investment to convince more and more players in this, in this vision. Hmm? This is our, our main uh, concern. This is our main uh, con concept. And data is, uh, as, as all we know, the main uh, oil of, of uh, 21st century. And our mission is to, uh, how to figure out uh, all this amount of data uh, uh, in terms of uh, understanding uh, patterns, understanding uh, trends, uh, to help the, 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 the right decision in the right time. Okay, thanks very much, gentlemen. Uh, in fact, from now on, uh, we have agreed that, uh, that anybody uh, could uh, ask uh, a question, and could intervene. But I cannot uh, help but uh, you have talked about uh, that your last word has been uh, data is the, the oil, the fuel of 21st century. We know who, who owns the oil in, in the 20th century. Uh, my question would be, and, and it's an open, an open uh, debate, but my question to any of you would, would be, who owns the data in the f 21st century? Because there are many origins of the data. There are, obviously, there, are, there is data that belongs to somebody, but uh, there is data who, there is a debate. I would like to have here a representative, for instance, of mobile operators who may have uh, their own ideas. But uh, let me be provocative. Who, who owns the data in, uh, in the 21st century? Any of you? Well, it's, it's a risky question. <laughs> yeah. It's a risky question. Well, um, depends, uh, despite of the, the, the property of data, um, uh, all of us, we are convinced of the, of the power of data. And um, uh, we, we, we need to understand the, 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 the meaningful uh, explanation of data uh, to, in, to enforce, uh, to enhance the, the, the I mean, the, the open data um, uh, way, uh, how the, the, the enterprise, how the citizens re really access and really have uh, uh, a fluent of, of data to, 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 uh, to become this, this potential oil in real uh, intelligent applications. That's my, my decision. You, you look like a politician. You don't answer my question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll have a go. <laughs> okay. um, so I'm not, I don't really like the analogy with oil. I understand what you're saying, of course. Uh, but again, I guess it goes back to my point that we didn't we didn't make cities to, to use oil. Um, and in fact, when we've made decisions based around infrastructure like that, they've often gone wrong. So I'm thinking of um, General Motors allegedly lobbying the city of Los Angeles in the 1950s to remove the public tramway system in order to create more traffic on a different kind of network, if you like, um, which was a shift towards cars and, rather than public trams. And that infrastructure-led thinking, of course, then maybe generated 30 years of growth in LA, but they'll be dealing with the problem that it created for the next century or so. So that infrastructure-led thinking, I think, is quite 
difficult and dangerous territory. And again, it's why I'd rather start at the other end and say um, data can be produced from all kinds of things, from any angle, actually, we can imagine. So the question is, well, what is the service that you're going to build on top of the data? And then we can talk about ownership, potentially. So again, bringing out public transport. Um, if public transport operators own the data around how people are moving around their city, and the public transport operator is a provision of the city, so it's the city of Barcelona, then the more people that use that system, it generates value within the city. It reinforces the idea of the city as a public good, if you like. So you get a better system, which is great. Users prefer that as well. But it's also deriving value which stays within the city, essentially. You feel like you're building a civic sense as a result of using the transport system. If it's coming in from a, a different angle, if it's a new disruptive, innovative startup, a privatized startup, essentially, which might be located offshore and paying tax elsewhere, the more that service is used, the less value is generated for the city, even though the citizens still think, well, that's a good user experience, I might use it. So I, I go, actually, I think it's deeper than necessarily data. It's more about the service again. And it's only when you actually design the service that you decide the details of public ownership, private ownership, where the data is going, and what the data is reinforcing. Yeah, but I... Uh, um, I'll, I'll, um, uh, I've been... On, I've been on, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? No. Yeah, I, um, I've been knowing Dan for a long time, so I can, uh, I can disagree with him. Um, <laughs> and I think, actually, there's a problem with the data, not only with the services, but with the data itself. So what has been happening today, what we've been doing over the past uh, 10 years or more, is actually create a digital copy of our physical world. In technical terms, in engineering terms, is what we call a cyber-physical system. So digital and physical are combined. And then in this type of system, in this type of system, you know, whoever has control of the digital side then has control also on the physical side. So the data is very important. Now, today's data access is non-symmetrical. You've got big companies or big states actually having much more access than other companies, than people, than other states. And I think that's, that's a fact. And I think it's a fact we should all be aware of. Um, it's, uh, the, the condition is radically changing. You know, I don't think it's only about access. It's really the very amount of data. Is, um, just let me give you an example. You know, like uh, in, in this very room, if you had met like uh, uh, 10 years ago, you would have probably like uh, two cameras. And people would take pictures. People, pictures would not be digital. And you know, they would end up in a drawer, stay there for, for decades, and then disappear. So nobody thought that taking picture would be, would, taking picture would be like an innocent thing. Now, uh, you fast forward, and today in this camera, in, in this room, there is more cameras than people. All of your phones has a, have at least two cameras. Every computer has one, every iPod here. A lot of people are tweeting, are taking pictures, and so on. So even something as simple as that is digitizing what we are doing here and can actually create uh, issues of privacy, as you know. Um, Switzerland was one of the first countries, I believe, to ban the Google Street View car because of this. So we're digitizing everything. We are creating this cyber-physical system. And today, access to data is not symmetrical. There's uh, many ways to deal with this. Um, you know, some people think we could also make everything free uh, and accessible to everybody. Um, apparently, at the time of uh, when all of us we were hunter and gatherers, there was no privacy, so you know everything would be shared. So that's a possibility. There's many others. Now I don't know what is the right one, but I know that this discussion is a discussion we all need to have because this discussion is the discussion that's going to decide what type of society we're going to have tomorrow. And it is a problem. Yes, not only about services, about data itself. Um, um, yeah, Jordi for, sí. first. Gracias. Yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, Antes he hablado de que nosotros somos una empresa de infraestructuras, y es cierto, pero el concepto de infraestructuras ha evolucionado y esto ha hecho que nos aproximemos a infraestructuras basadas en sistemas, en IT, y esto nos sitúa a nuestra compañía en una doble visión, la visión muy cercana a las redes de telecomunicación y una visión muy por encima, básicamente a través de un proyecto europeo que hemos desarrollado con el Ayuntamiento de Barcelona, con ayuntamientos de Italia, con ayuntamientos de la Gran Bretaña y algún instituto de investigación de Alemania, que eh, lo que pretende es abrir las redes, abrir las infraestructuras a los desarrolladores de aplicaciones y abrir los datos. Por lo tanto, nosotros también nos hemos planteado como empresa el tema de los datos. ¿De quién son los datos? ¿Para qué sirven los datos? ¿Cómo se deben de poner a disposición de quién los datos? Aparte, mi formación es jurídica, con lo cual he hecho una aproximación personal a este, a este problema. Y lo he planteado muchas veces y nadie me da respuesta de quién son los datos. Yo creo que nadie sabe cuál es la respuesta 
y hay pocas personas o pocas entidades interesadas en abrir este debate porque es un debate muy complejo, a mi modo de ver. Es evidente que los datos personales son de la persona, esto nadie lo duda. ¿Y qué, pero son, los datos ¿y qué son los datos personales? Los datos de cada uno de nosotros. Eh, ¿Cuánto yo gasto con mi visa? ¿Es mío o es del banco que si me Si yo entro en una tienda o no, ¿es un dato personal o no? Yo creo que sí, pero hay gente que lo discute también. Por tanto, ahí hay una visión jurídica, regulatoria, de bastante recorrido. Pero es que además, luego digamos los datos agregados. Ahí dicen, bueno, los datos agregados son de quien los agrega, de quien los recibe, de quien los compila. Pero a través de los datos agregados generamos nuevos datos, que son distintos de los datos de origen. ¿De quién son los datos agregados? Los nuevos datos que se generan. Seguramente de la entidad, pública o privada, que genera esos nuevos datos a partir de la agregación. Es muy complejo el mundo del dato, muy complejo. Y como será, en el, será el petróleo del siglo XXI o no será, pero en todo caso tiene un valor inmenso y hay multitud de grandes compañías a, que están lanzadas al, a la gestión del dato, a la venta del dato, eh, yo creo que hay un poco de interés. Pero es un debate que necesariamente deberemos abordar porque habrá un momento que las gentes y las, y las entidades reclamarán saber qué se hace con sus datos, para qué sirven, qué beneficios se sacan de sus datos. Bueno, una, un ejemplo clarísimo es el derecho a borrar la memoria en Internet. Al final, esto también son datos. Es por poner un ejemplo, ¿no? Gracias. Ok. Amr. Sure. I have a slightly different view. I think we're talking here about a, the physical world and we're applying a physical world terminology on the digital world. The challenge in your question is, in my opinion, is the word ownership. Ownership is a legal status that we have gotten used to in the physical world. You own a piece of land, you own a house, you own a car. <laughs> But in the digital world, we're still trying to manipulate the digital world to look like the physical world, which I don't think that, that should exist. Digital, if I have a piece of data today that I got my, act, my hands on, I didn't create it, I just got my hands on it in one way or another, and I use that data to create a level of intelligence that allows me to make better decisions for my business, nobody asks me that I stole this data or where did I get this data from, I just used it. In the physical world, that means if I'm standing on a piece of land, I can build a house on it anytime I want, although I don't own it, which doesn't make sense. This is why I think there is a digital world, which is physical, digital, getting together, that we need to have new ways of understanding what data belongs to who, how, where, and regulate it, but in a, in a, in a way that is applicable to this new digital world, not to the old physical environment. Okay, uh, yeah, Carlo. Yeah, can I just say oh, on sorry, from... Peter. Peter, yeah. yeah, can I just say on from the urban planning perspective? Um, we look at data, there are different dimensions of data. One is, the first dimension is on um, those, what we call fundamental data set, like your roots, your buildings, uh, the land use plan, and so on. Those are data that re uh, re usually reside with the government. The second segment of data is really about the demographic, the social behavioral pattern. And, so this, uh, and the third segment is about real-time information, about how people are moving, the vehicle are moving, from cell phone data and GPS and so on. And the fourth set of data set is really about uh, those in the social media, uh, what you post in Facebook and, and, and so on. So the four segment of data set, I think they are very useful for different purposes, for planning, and they have different owners, business, government, uh, uh, public, and so on. But I, I look at it, what's really important is really that uh, we all recognize that it's uh, useful to put this together. That's why there's a big movement of making open, open data, so making this available and applied services, like what Dan mentioned, and that is really the, the important part. And, and the ownership of, uh, issue, I think, is uh, perhaps the, the less critical in, in this. Okay. Yeah. Can I come back? So let me try digging a bit deeper, because I, I, I don't think I got Carla to disagree with me enough. But <laughs> so I'll see if I can do better. Um, this is where I think, again, the analogy with oil breaks down, because I think we have maybe I don't know enough about oil, but I would guess there is crude oil and refined oil, and it's produced in one place and then distributed around. Data is so different to that as a thing, as in uh, we're doing an air quality sensing project, 
And in reality, of course, with air quality sensing, you're looking at a landscape of sensors, some privately owned, some publicly owned, some very precise scientific instruments run by the meteorological office in the UK, some built into phones increasingly, which might be very crude, but very personal and intimate. So they have huge value as a result at that point. We need to understand, I think, the deeper question there about what is air quality? What do we want to do about it as a city? How do we explain that to citizens? How do they react to that? Then look at the, the data that's being generated as a result and have it a conversation that understands, well, that's private and very local. This is public and highly scientific. There are these points in between. It's a highly complex landscape of data there in reality. And so we can, we can increase the data literacy on both the cities and the citizens' side in order to deal with that. I think you only get to that understanding, again, when you're trying to create a policy or build a business or change something. And again, that's where I go back to why are you producing the data? Why does one produce data? To make something, to make a service, to change the city in some way. And that, again, is where I think there's a huge difference with oil as, a, as an analogy. We're talking about something far more varied, uh, something public and private. And it's where some analogies about the city actually become useful, because then we can learn from our use of shared spaces, like public space in the city, which we have an understanding of going back millennia. So there might be something we can bring from physical into digital. I fully agree we need to go the other way too, but I think that's, that's why I struggle with the oil analogy. Okay, uh, if there is no further comment, uh, data is one of the key words of the session. The second key word is services. Uh, the closest to a politician that is in this session are the two CIOs. I, I did not uh, introduce myself, I'm sorry, I'm the CIO of Barcelona and uh, we have the CIO of Singapore. So we work with politicians, and they are very worried about... <laughs> we remind you that at 7 p.m. o'clock, the show will close its doors. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> it's very clear. <laughs> got it. <laughs> I, have a, I have a clock here, but uh, that's good. So um, my question is, how do you think that, uh, that cities should, uh, should cope with these services like, uh, like Airbnb, Uber, in, some, in many places in Europe, in Barcelona, in Berlin, and other places, cities have reacted uh, against passing legislation, siding with, uh, with uh, taxi, taxi owners, taxi drivers. Um, what are your feelings about these services which are not public, but are not exactly pi private because they are used by, by the public. They are, there is uh, this question of ownership here too. So you have any, any comment on that? Sure. Sure. Well, um, you know, you mentioned Uber, and certainly Uber has polarized uh, public opinion you know, all over the world over the past few months. Now, I don't know if the winner will be Uber, but certainly a system like Uber will see what we will see tomorrow. Will be, is what we will see tomorrow. Um, such a system actually allows you to get a lot of efficiency on the system, on the, in this case about mobility and transportation and taxis. And the same thing is happening everywhere, everywhere else. You know, we, men we mentioned some of them before. So it seems to me that basically when you're doing that, you're going to go have a gain for society. And there's an interim space when uh, we'll have some struggle. You know, some people who were part of the old system will try to fight. It's a little bit like, you know, when the train yeah. went to the west coast of the United States. Some of the people who had uh, uh, the cars uh, with, with, uh, with horses started fighting the train and tried to stop it. But, you know, after a while, the train finally went and, and that world was, was wiped out. I think, you know, there's no doubt that, that the world is actually is more efficient for everybody sooner or later will actually happen. In the meanwhile, we have a bit of struggle. I don't know if it will be, if it will be Uber or somebody else, but something like that, and something like that in a lot of the other services, in the end, will, is what we will use, because we know it. We know it is, is much better. You can get a taxi when you want it. You, you know, it's much easier. It's, it's better for you. It's better for a taxi driver. It's better for the system as a whole. You can also share mobility. Again, going back to what, uh, what we were saying before, actually, Uber pool, uh, was partially inspired by some of the results of the paper we did, the one I mentioned before. Uber put the lives actually to share the ride itself. So, um, so there's no doubt that this will happen. There's a temporary thing that so, has always been the case, and then some small revolutions, and, uh, and the world will move on. Uh, I hope there's yes. no taxi drivers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> or we'll be in trouble. <laughs> no, I, well, I think that, that, that's a key point, isn't it? Because there's, there's huge debate from 
whether it's any good from the driver's view at all. Many of the Uber drivers would say they have to work incredibly long hours to achieve a minimum wage equivalent because they have none of the traditional protection that a taxi <coughs> industry <coughs> offers that. So I go back again to uh, can, we, can we peel apart the different things that Uber is, for example. We could also look at Airbnb or Lyft or Bridge or Ridge, you know, all of them. But there's a great user experience there. Absolutely no doubt that that's what some future of mobility looks like. I want, I'm here. I want to get something towards me. It's reliable. It's, I know the price in advance. I can do the transaction electronically. It takes me where I need to go. It knows where I need to go because of GPS and maps. All of that super possible. Uh, Halo has exactly the same experience. So you can separate that from what Uber is doing, essentially, and say that's, that's a good thing. The question I go back to again is then ownership. Is it, is it good for the city? Good for the citizens and good for the city are two different things. So good for the users, absolutely, potentially. Not, well, the jury is out, I suppose, whether it's good for the drivers, but there's clearly evidence either side there. But does it reinforce the idea of the city? Why couldn't a, for example, a publicly owned transit agency of some kind offer something equivalent? If the user experience can be transferred and isn't particularly unique to Uber, uh, there's no reason why Barcelona couldn't offer a shared driving solution of some kind, maybe a minibus or something in between taxis and buses and trains when autonomous vehicles come in. Is the city of Barcelona going to be the service that is offered there with that kind of user experience? Because again, if it is, then the increased usage of that service reinforces the city as a public good. Under the conditions of it being an equivalent of Uber, again, that money drifts away from the city and they're probably trying to avoid paying taxes locally as well. So there are particular dynamics, what some are called the Californian ideology dynamics, around those kinds of things, which we need to separate from the user experience and all of the efficiency gains that Carlo talks about, because I think we'd all want the user experience and the efficiency gains. The core question is, again, who owns it and run it? And that, that's, that's up for grabs, as far as I can see. Jordi? This is a debate, a my way of ver que tiene una relevancia muy transitoria. ¿Por qué? Las revoluciones tecnológicas han destruido cientos, miles de profesiones que habían existido a lo largo de la historia. Eh, que se lo pregunten si no a la industria discográfica, por ejemplo. ¿Alguna experiencia tienen estos señores que hacían discos eh, con la revolución tecnológica de, de, supuesta para el digital y el acceso a Internet de los ciudadanos? Yo creo que el, el debate de los taxistas y de Uber tiene un interés transitorio de unos cuantos años, los pocos años que tarden en aparecer los coches autoconducidos. El día que aparezcan los coches autoconducidos, que alguna empresa norteamericana de, de, de gran renombre está uh, desarrollando, y supongo que habrá otras que también estarán experimentando lo mismo, ni taxis, ni Uber, ni coches particulares. Habrá una flota de taxis por la ciudad que tú llamarás cuando lo necesites, le dirás dónde quiere que te lleve y el coche te llevará. Ni carnés de conducir, ni escuelas de, de, de aprendizaje de conducción, ni ingenieros del Estado examinando conductores, ni nada de nada. Todo esto está llamado a desaparecer en pocos años. Por tanto, es un debate que sí, tiene una cierta gracia ahora, pero tiene corto vuelo. Permítame que sea un poco... Radical. Te permito lo que quieras. Ah, any thoughts about that? <clears throat> so uh, let's open to the public because at seven it seems that uh, everything closes. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've been uh, we've been warned. We warned. So is any question from the from the audience? Yes, over there, please. Uh, yeah. There is Mike. Hi. Okay. Um, you've been mentioning um, the agricultural revolution, right? I did. <laughs> yes, you did. So it's true that it brought cities and it brought, you know, it, it, it gave us time to, to dedicate to art and culture and things like that. But on the other hand, uh, the life expectancy, if you passed, I don't know, your childhood, uh, was drastically reduced once you pass from hunter-gatherers to the agricultural cult, um, society, right? So there are good things and, and bad things. And well, I'm working in data integration, semantics for data in integration. So I'm, I'm all for data and I like having a lot of data, but I do notice that um, 
you know, you don't have to look further ahead than the newspapers to see that, you know, there are some statistics and you think that it's serious stuff because somebody, and then you realize that, well, few people realize that a lot of the results are actually bogus. And sometimes because of the methods, but a lot of the times because the, the data has really poor quality, because there's a lot of it, and a lot of it has poor quality. And for example, um, sensors, right? You're, somebody uh, uh, wasn't mentioning. Please, uh, uh, I try to formulate uh, the question. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> have you, um, in your respective businesses, have you toppled with this problem of data quality and how do you go about it? Because I, th I personally think it's, well, I had a problem with it. Thank you. Maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll say something, I think. Hello? Yeah. I'll say something, I think it's, uh, it's a good point, but you know, but I don't think I follow your logic. You know, the, the Israeli, he was the prime minister in the UK over 100 years ago, and what he used to say is, you know, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. And, you know, and at the time, the point is that you know, using the data in the way you don't want it to be used is something that, that has been there always. Now, I think you say sometimes the data is not very good quality, but I still say, I would say, it's much better to have bad quality data <clears throat> than no data at all, which is the condition we had before. And there's no <laughs> doubt you know, that, yes, we have a lot of bad data, but we have an incredible amount of data. You know, we, we said it several times, if you take all the data produced by humanity from the beginning, for thousands of years, from the beginning to 2003, well, that's what we produce now every 24 to 48 hours. So they give you the same, you know, it's all the same quality. In the first chunk, you had uh, Shakespeare and Cervantes and, uh, you know, you name it, everybody, and uh, uh, now you don't have a Shakespeare every weekend, <laughs> but actually the, the quantity is exactly the same. So I think, you know, I, I don't, I'm sure you follow your logic. Uh, yes, a lot of the data is bad data, but uh, uh, better bad data than, than no data. Then, uh, then, uh yeah, I, I think I go back again to this point around communication and literacy. Um, and uh, again, the air quality project we're running in London, we've done ethnographic research with residents about how they understand air. And of course, they don't really understand air quality, but we have incredibly good data in a sense about air quality. We have scientific instruments on the top of buildings that have been giving air quality readings for decades, actually, and they're in the newspaper every day. It's just meaningless because they're not communicated. They're not translated into something that citizens can understand and act upon. They are literally there in the evening standard next to the weather. It will talk about particulates per billion of nitrogen <laughs> oxides. So <laughs> we, it's, I, to me, I get, we can, again, we can generate more data. We can generate l loose data, lossy data. We can generate all kinds of different kinds of data. As I said earlier, a landscape of data is emerging around air quality. The core question for me is then, how do we translate that into something communicable? And what does that mean that we can then act upon? Antonio? Very briefly. Um, the problem of quality. Uh, absolutely. Um, the difference between gross data and qualified data is the distance that we solve uh, to uh, create experiment, experimentation um, environment, incubators environment, uh, to create that value coming from data. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, despite of uh, a property of data, the main question is who is uh, uh, concerned, who is uh, obliged to, to, to keep the, 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 the data quality uh, in order to create uh, 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 intelligent uh, uses uh, uh, about that. So, this is a, a concern that, that is uh, in my point of, of vision, uh, mainly in governments, mainly in councils, mainly in the, in the, in the uh, politicians who deliver the, 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 the infrastructure to create, uh, uh, to, create uh, to generate uh, uh, enrichment, and, 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 and it's, it's not an easy, an easy solution. Uh, ten, yeah, just quick, because we have another question, please, 10 seconds each, just uh, two sentences. Muy cortito. Eh, mi colega de Cisco citaba al principio de su intervención la estructura en silos de, los de la información y los servicios municipales hasta el momento presente. Justamente la revolución de la Smart City, si se hace bien, a mi modo de ver, por encima de la capa de infraestructuras está una capa de inteligencia que he citado de pasada. Esta capa de inteligencia debe de permitir compendiar millones de datos, contrastarlos entre sí, 
hacerlos sólidos, desechando los erróneos, si pones la inteligencia adecuada desecharás los erróneos, y poner a disposición de los usuarios, institucionales, compañías, eh, ciudadanos, datos muy sólidos, datos muy fiables, mucho más fiables que hasta el momento presente. Okay. Peter. I just want to add on, it's really in, uh, the quality of data is an interactive process. I agree fully with Carol that bad data is still better than no data. And uh, uh, in Singapore, it's not easy to get data. But as we start using data, we find that there's a need for better quality and we go ahead and get it. So it's an interactive process to improve the quality. Thank you. Another question from the audience? Yes. Please. My question is why we don't talk about privacy? Eh? We, I think that we all need an application that assured no one can access to my smartphone, no access to my laptop. So in my opinion, if the new technology is not uh, able to assure our privacy, it's better to put a break, no? It's, we need a balance. We, ne we need a balance eh, because too much big data interchange without, but so without any uh, what is the question, something. please? And the question is why we do not talk about privacy. Eh? Uh, no, we, now, we, because we don't have time, data. but uh, is there any is, is there any uh, reason why don't not to talk about privacy? I, no. I did mention it. <laughs> <laughs> again, I got, again, when, Thank you, make, you, for, for when you make the thing, I think <laughs> that's when you figure out the privacy issues. I said the ethical issues again with with air quality sensing, only when you make the network, deploying the sensors to the street, designing the boxes, do you then have to figure out, well, what's the ownership model? What's the privacy model? What's the ethical model? What, what, where's the business model here? That's, that's the point at which you can really sensibly talk about privacy, because we've seen citizens are happy to give certain data away if they derive something of value back. And it's only when you make the thing do you derive the value exchange. That's when we can talk privacy. Any further thoughts be before, before they close us all here inside? <laughs> Uh, ok. En cualquier caso, George Orwell escribió algo. Sí, run away. No, thank you very much to the, the, our distinguished guys. Thank you. Uh, ok, I think we'll have uh, time enough. Thank you very much to all. Thank you.